Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. I'm Tamir Geffen, the CEO of ALM Toolbox Company. We are experts in ALM, Application Lifecycle Management. We are authorized distributor of GitLab and we have experience in supporting GitLab, providing services, training, development of plugins and automations, and selling licenses. We have also experienced over the years in planning software development processes and utilizing complementary tools like Jira, Git, Jenkins, ClearCase, ClearQuest, Installer Tools, and more. We have a new special guest today, Jörg van der Voort, the VP of Product at GitLab Company. He is going to present what's new in GitLab and to provide a live demo. At the end, we will have time for Q&A. Feel free to ask questions in the chat window or just email us, gitlab at almtoolbox.com. Okay, so let's get started. Jörg, can you hear me? Are you ready? I'm all good to me, thanks. Okay, okay, great. So I'm just giving you the control, just a second. All right, shalom everybody. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I will start with a, a brief overview of what we're going to talk about. Uh, I want to briefly go over our vision today. I'm going to talk about what's new in GitLab 9.2 and, and give you a sneak peek at 9.3, and then I'll show you uh, a live demo. If you have questions in the meantime, feel free to ask them. Uh, I don't have a very strict script, so I'm happy to diverge a bit based on what you would like to hear and see. So to start off, what we want to do with GitLab is not just have a place for your Git repositories. We want to give you the tools to go from ID all the way to production and beyond that, giving you feedback. So that means any step from coming up with an idea, creating an issue, planning it, writing the code, committing it, but also actually testing it and deploying that, you can do all of these things straight from within GitLab. So this is what I'm going to demo you to you today. Uh, but before that, I'm just going to briefly jump into what is new. Um, and then uh, you will see exactly how we realize all of these steps within GitLab. So what's new? First off, we started translating GitLab. So as you may know, GitLab is available in English right now. Uh, but what we started to do is we started to make GitLab uh, to internationalize GitLab. So you, it will be available in a number of languages, starting first with just German and Spanish, but we're seeing already many community contributions uh, and seeing GitLab slowly being translated. This is something I will show you in a bit. We recently added the ability to have performance feedback inside of a merge request, and I will go into that later, so I'm going to skip over for it for now. We recently introduced Service Desk. It means that you can from within GitLab provide support with people that do not have access to your instance. So anyone can just send you an email towards your GitLab project and you can help them from within uh, GitLab. We, we now also allow you to assign multiple people to issues. We do canary deployments and it's something I can actually show you in a bit as well. We provide burn down charts, and I might be able to show you if we have enough time, but it allows you to quickly have an overview of how well you're progressing through a milestone. And we have something that we call scheduled pipelines, which allow you to run a particular pipeline, and I will show you pipelines in a bit, on a particular pattern. So for instance, every night at four, I want to test whether my master is still stable. I want to make sure that I deploy to something in particular. And in addition to all of this, what we now added is advanced search with Elasticsearch. So if you're using GitLab Enterprise Edition, you can now use more complex search phrases such as exclusion, saying I want only this or this specific phrase. It's a very powerful tool. And I want to give you a brief peek, sneak peek at 903 and tell about two features. So today I'll be actually demonstrating 902 because only Thursday we are releasing 903. But there's so, so, so many exciting things coming. I just want to briefly mention them before jumping into the demo. The first one being code quality. So this Thursday, we'll be releasing GitLab 903. And with GitLab 903, you just need to add a single or two lines to your CI configuration. And GitLab will be able to tell you what the quality of your code is and whether it has improved or degraded based on particular rules that you can set and that you can choose. And it will, GitLab will do that straight inside of the application. So you don't have to check for very simple things. For instance, if you look at uh, code and you do, do a review, in normal circumstances, you have to make sure to check, for instance, 
whether dependencies are secure, whether you're introducing um, too much complexity, and GitLab will now do that automatically. So it's a very, very powerful feature available in GitLab Enterprise Edition. And we'll have multi-project pipeline graphs. So today what I will show you is I will show you a pipeline of a single project, but in the future what you'll be able to do, so starting on Thursday, you'll be able to see over multiple projects how pipelines relate and what the status is. But let's to quickly go for the new stuff. Let me just show you how um, a normal setup works, like how, how does GitLab uh, work in everyday life. So what I'm going to demo to you today um, is an empty GitLab instance. There's nothing there yet. The only thing I did is I set up GitLab using the Helm chart that we have available uh, on a Kubernetes cluster. So the whole setup that I did takes about 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, depending if things are downloaded quickly. Um, it requires only a few steps, and you can actually find the whole setup right here, this URL that I pasted here. So it's hand, about GitLab.com, handbook product, ITP demo, and then you, the setup. We will share the, the link after the webcast. That's great. Thanks, mm -hmm. Maria. All right, yeah, so what I'm welcome. going to do now is I'm going to start sharing my Chrome window so you will be able to see what I'm doing. Let's have a look. All right. Okay, so Tamir, are you able to see yeah. my Yeah, Yeah, I can see I can see it. All right, great. So this is an empty instance. You can see the URL here. Um, this is my own domain, job ITP, ID to production, and this is GitLab in front of it. So all I did is I set up here in Kubernetes, and this you can do today, and it's fully stable, and you can use this in production. Of course, you can also deploy GitLab in any other, any other way that you might prefer. So when you set up GitLab, when you install it on a Kubernetes cluster like this, you do not only get GitLab, but you get also all the other tools of GitLab, such as MetaMost and Prometheus with it. And it all installs and it managed automatically by GitLab and all integrated, because we want to give you that full integrated experience. So the first thing I'm going to do today is I'm going to create a new group. And let's say that I have a company and that company um, is interested in making websites for cat owners. So let's create a new group. And let's call the group cats, because we're a big fan of cats. I make it public so anyone can see it. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to leave this check, which says create a MetaMost team for this group. And you'll see briefly what that means. So I'll create a group. And as we are making a website, uh, I'm going to start out with a very simple Ruby application. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new project inside of this group. I'm going to call it uh, web or maybe website. Let's say website. And I'm going to import a simple app. So I have here as a minimal Ruby application. And I'm just going to copy this application and paste the URL. All right. So and don't forget to mute yourself if you're online. Otherwise, you'll be able to hear you. All right. Uh, I'm happy with this. I'm just going to make it public. I'm going to create project. So what is happening right now is that we are quickly importing that repository. Ah, there we go. There it is already. So we have now our repository in the project called website. And all this is is a very simple Ruby application. Um, it has a little uh, Docker file to define what should happen here. As you see, it's very simple. It just exposes the port. And it's a simple Ruby file. And I have here a little Ruby script. And as you can see, the only thing this Ruby script does is it will say, hello world. Now, this is the point, the point where, in normal circumstances, you would maybe use an external application, go somewhere else, or maybe you would just want to communicate with your colleagues. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do something which is unique to GitLab. I'm going to set up a staging area and set up CI and continuous integration, continuous deployment in just a single click. Uh, maybe maybe two, or, two or three clicks. But um, So what you see here, you see set up auto deploy. So I'm going to click this. And GitLab prompts me to create a file, the CI YAML, 
And with the CI YAML, it will give me the capabilities to run GitLab CI. And I'm going to use a template, and I'm going to use a template for Kubernetes, because that's why I deploy it. All I have to do is I have to change the domain. So my domain is job.it.com. I can set the commit message, but I'm happy with this. And I'm just going to deploy straight to master. So I'm not going to say I'm starting a merge request. All right, let's commit that. The file has been created, as you can see. And what will immediately happen is that GitLab will detect this commit that I just made. And it will see in that commit that I have defined a GitLab CI YAML file. And based on that, it's going to run CI. And because I deployed on Kubernetes, not only do I have GitLab, but we automatically set up auto-scaling CI. So that means that we create runners to run our jobs in CI. And what GitLab automatically does is creates new containers as they are necessary. So you don't have to have a huge infrastructure just to make sure you have enough capacity. No, GitLab just creates these containers when they are necessary and they, it shuts it down again when they are no longer in use. So let's have a look at this. We, we go to pipelines. And this is where we can see. Uh, and you already see here that there's a, a pipeline here with a commit or master set up auto deploy and that's particular stages. And if we click here, we can see it in detail. And what we see is that in auto, we're using auto deploy, GitLab predefined these stages. And of course you can make as many stages as you want. You can have them branching or dependent on each other. Um, but the default configuration of auto deploy is that we have a build a staging and a production. So the build one, we can just have a look here, what exactly happened. What it does is simply build the Docker container and it puts it in, in the registry because GitLab has a built-in registry. And if we go to staging, what it looks like is that there's a deployment, right, to a place called staging. Um, and in fact, that is exactly what GitLab do, did. And if we go to environments, we see that there's here an environment that we created. And this was automatically created by GitLab called staging. And actually, if we click here, we see that the environment opens. So you see website, because that's what the project is that we called it, staging. And this was automatically again generated by GitLab. And we actually see it executed here. So our little application is running here in a container created by GitLab, just because we made that single commit with that GitLab CI name. And it says, hello world. Now, this might be a little bit uh, simple. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replicate what I would do when I would talk to colleagues, which is I'm going to talk with my colleagues in chat we're going to create an issue based on that. And based on that issue, we're going to make changes to the application. Now, I said on the beginning that we would immediately have this whole number of dependencies ready for you, right? So the things that we ship together with GitLab, such as Mattermost. And that's actually what we're going to check out. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to mattermost.yop-itp.com. And remember that we said that we automatically created the group. And that's exactly what happened. So we have here a group created just because we selected that at the moment when we created the group inside of GitLab. And what we can do here is we can, from here, talk to our colleagues. Of course, now it's just me. <laughs> and actually what I'm going to do in this case, I'm going to set up an integration. So I'm going back to my website. I'm going to go to settings integrations, Mattermost slash commands, and I'm just going to say add to Mattermost. And that's all I have to do. Okay, it's for the team cats. You see that there was also already team dogs and the trigger word is website. All right, let's install it. All right, this is configured. So that means that now here at the town square of cats, I can simply type slash website help. Oh, I have to connect my GitLab account. We want to make sure that it's secure. So I click the link, I authorize it, and there we go, it's authorized. Let's try it again. Website. All right, I can, I can resize it even more if you want. Oh, that's fine. Like this. All right, can you see me typing now? All right, so 
let's just say that we we are happy with the application as it is, but we we think we might want to make some changes. So we, normally we would chat here in a, in MetaMost. Um, you can also use Slack. The same integration works with Slack, but MetaMost comes right to GitHub, so that's why I'm using that. So what I can do is I can say website on the repository website on the project website. I want to create a new issue, so I just say website issue new, and I'm going to say um, um, change. Uh, world into cats because we want to say hello cats instead and I can add some content here for the issue I can say um, hello world is not representative cats are better all right I just pressed enter and what happened is that the GitHub bot that was automatically integrated by me just giving it authorization created actually an issue in that specific project. So I can click on it. And what I actually see here is that issue. So I, GitLab itself is a very powerful issue tracker. And in this, we now created an, an issue to track our progress. So after we created the issue and we made the, the decision to do this, what we have to do next is, of course, plan it. So I'm going to go here to issues. And I'm going to go to boards. Issue boards gives you a very nice visual way to organize your issues. Um, and there's many ways that you can organize this and that you can work with this. It's a very, very powerful feature. But for today, I'm just going to keep it very simple. So I'm going to set, say, add the default list. And we're just going to add an issue to the to do column. All right, add. So now you can see the change world into cats is here in my to do. And if you were to check out the issue itself, you could see that we added the label to do, so it's easy to see, so you always know where your issue is. And if we go back to the board, what we can do, I want to now start working on this. So let's indicate that, and we just drag it here into doing. All right, and actually, if we check out this issue right now, you see that we removed the to-do label and we added the doing, so it's clear for everyone. All right, so let's actually do this. Let's change the hello world into hello cats. And um, normally, maybe what you normally would do is you would go in your local repository, but I'm going to do it all in GitLab because of course you can. So I'm going to go in my repository, I'm going to the file that I want to change, I'm just going to edit it. And of course, I'm doing very simple changes, but this works with almost any kind of application. And auto deploy actually works with more complex applications. So even if you make large changes, you'll be able to see them as we are today, just looking at a piece of text. So hello world becomes hello cats. All right, that looks good. And let's say the commit message becomes hello cats. And actually, rather than committing directly to master, we're gonna create a new branch, we call it hello cats. Of course, you can call it whatever you want. And we're going to automatically start a new merge request with these changes. So let's commit them. And what GitLab will do is it will immediately open this merge request for us. So it made a commit, it created a new branch, it put a commit on that branch, and now we are in the merge request view um, where we can create a new merge request. A merge Hello. request is like a pull request, correct? Yes, yeah, so a merge request is like a pull request. We opted to choose it a merge request, to name it a merge request because that's what actually is happening. You're requesting for your changes to be merged into a branch. It's much more um, effective naming that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I see here two more questions. So when you mm -hmm. when you get time, we sure. you want now? Uh, yeah, uh, shoot. Well, I, well, I submit it. <laughs> okay, first. okay. I see two questions. The first one of Elad. Um, can we use uh, repos from GitHub and Bitbucket without importing them? Um, for GitLab CI, no, you cannot. And the reason for that is very simple. You can, what you can do is you can import them and automatically mirror them. So any changes that you make in GitLab or in uh, GitHub or Bitbucket, they will be mirrored. But what we want to make sure is that when you're using GitLab, you're not, you don't have to constantly switch between applications. So in terms of repository function and the things you can do within Bitbucket and GitHub, you can do all of those things within GitLab as well that includes things like protected branches or 
um, mm -hmm. hooks that you might use or push rules, all of that can happen within GitLab. And, that, and having everything in one place makes everything much faster. And it actually allows you to track how fast you're progressing. And you'll see that in a bit as well. Okay, Elad, I, I hope it answered your question. And if you have further questions, just uh, text it again. Uh, I, another, another, another question I see uh, from Yossi. Can you import a local Git repository? And is it possible to have parameterized builds? Yes. So you can import a local repository. You can do, mm -hmm. So you just, well, you just push as you would normally do to a, to a Git repository. And then you could create one like that in GitLab. Um, so yes, and um, I'm not sure what he means with programmable builds, but what we're doing today is we Par parameter parameterized builds. I mean, to, uh, probably to to send parameters in advance. Oh yes. So mm -hmm. actually, you you have variables within CI, and you can change them in any way you want. The mm -hmm. way GitLab CI works is that we have these runners, and whenever a new commit is detected, or whenever you trigger a build, which you can do. Uh, manually through the API or scheduled, um, it's up to you to define what happens. And you can have parameters somewhere else that you pull in. You can use GitLab's uh, variables. Basically, the the way the runners work is they just execute whatever you've defined. So you're very very flexible in uh, running whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the runner is just like a, a Jenkins slave, correct? Right, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So the runners just connect to GitLab to get and then they just run whatever you want. It's based on a simple Go binary, so it can run on any platform that you want. So whether you're running it in a VM, whether you're running it on a container cluster, uh, whether that's independent of your OS, everywhere where you can run a Go binary, where just anywhere, um, you, can, you can have a runner. So we will officially support all the major Linux distributions, we Mac OS, uh, Windows, basically anything you can think of, you can run your builds on. Okay, great. So go ahead, please. All right. So I created the merge request, which is, as Tamir said, is like a, a pull request. And uh, you see my changes here. And of course, I have full code review capability. So I can write a comment here and say, yay. Um, but of course, what I can also do is I can have a look at my commits. I see there's one commit here. We can have just a discussion about my code. And actually, we'll see the comments here. And you can have inline discussions and resolve them, for instance, to be able to track them. But what you also see is that we have, again, the pipelines here. And you see already two stages passed. And if we hover over them, we have, again, the build that we saw before. But now we have something new, which is called review. And what GitLab did is it saw this merge request being created. So it created the runner to make sure that we actually test the code, right, and we perform the pipeline. But then it saw that we created the stage which we call a review app. And a review app is a temporary dynamic environment. So remember that we set up staging before? That was an environment and that's a sort of a permanent one, right? We, we leave it alive and we make deployments to that and then it changes versions. What we did here is something you can only do with a deep integration of your repository and your issue tracker and your CI CD. And that is create a dynamic environment we call a review app. And a review app allows us to see the changes that we've made before they are live. So they are not live in staging, they're not live in production, they're only live on staging. Uh, in, uh, not, uh, not on staging, they're only live in this specific environment that we created for this merge request. And to show you that, I can actually click on this link and then we'll see here, hello cats, and you see them URL is actually a little bit strange. It says hello, but it says website, so the name of the project, review, because it's a review app, the name of the branch, and then a string to make sure that we don't have name clashes. Um, so what this is, is this is a dynamic environment we only created for this merge request. So imagine how powerful this is, that while you're doing code review, you can actually try out and check out the live changes before they are live somewhere else, before they are committed to master, before they are in a staging branch, you can actually try them out before merging something. And I think that's very, very powerful. The cool thing about this is, is that not only do we have this environment now to try out, once we decide to merge it, we don't need this environment anymore. So GitLab will automatically break it down again as well. So you don't have resources laying around. And this environment only exists for review. 
So what the menu reviewer could do is they could look here at the code and of course see that everything is well, but if you have, for instance, changes in the front end or just, just want to try out or you have a QA team, they could just use the review app and then directly comment here before anything is merged. So that really reduces the time that you go through that whole cycle of actually bringing something to production because you can review everything in one step. Right, I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, I think it looks as what you wanted. It's a hello cats. And I like the changes, so I'm just gonna press merge. And GitLab will now merge the changes. In the meantime, do you have any more questions, Tamir? Yeah, I see another one uh, okay. asked by Dima, so I'm taking a quote. Um, so you are actually saying Jenkins and Jira are all in one embedded. Is GitLab so powerful so we can stop using other ALM tools? <laughs> That, that, that's a great question, and of course, I would say yes. That is the idea behind GitLab. We believe very strongly that you should be able to use a single tool to do all of this. I would say that if you're using Jira today, GitLab's issue tracker is very powerful, but it doesn't provide all the functionality. So you can yes. integrate Jira and just use that at the same time. Mm -hmm. Anything you can do with Jenkins, you can basically do with GitLab CI, and GitLab CI actually does a whole lot more because it's so well integrated and it provides these kind of capabilities out of the box. It's very flexible because you can just define to run whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you can also integrate it with uh, Slack, as you mentioned before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. the, so everything I've shown today in Mattermost, you can actually also do inside of Slack. The integration is one-on-one -on -one and it works exactly the same. And in fact, if you're using Microsoft Teams, you can also use that. So uh, we do our best to integrate with all these chat tools. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, do you want another question? Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there artifactory integration in GitLab CI? So we don't have artifactory integration right now, but we are working on that. Um, what we do have is we do have artifact storage. So for particular artifacts that you might not need permanently, or even the ones that you do, you can just store them inside of GitLab. And we have a specific way of managing those, and it's, it's quite powerful. It's not 100% artifactory, so we're working on an actual integration for that as well. Okay. I, I see another question there that was asked by the same mm -hmm. guy. What about Git LFS using artifactory as storage? Uh, no, you cannot do that. And mm -hmm. There's, there are several reasons for that. Um, maybe it's something we'll do in the future. I don't think it's a bad idea necessarily. Um, but right now we just have a particular place inside of GitLab where we store, store the LFS artifacts. And we have to make sure to easily bind them to the repository. It's one of those cases we use something external that can be very tricky to manage. Um, so it's definitely something we consider. We will consider, uh, but it's not something that we'll do on the short term. Okay, thanks. So I, I just want to, to remind all, the, all our listeners, so if you want to ask more questions, feel free to, to text and we will take another break soon. All right, so what we did now is I accepted a merge request because I like the changes that we saw in the dynamic environment. And actually, once I press merge, you saw this third one saying running and now it's finished and it says cleanups uh, is done. So if I refresh this one, yeah, you see this domain doesn't exist anymore. This is where the, the review app used to be, and now it's actually gone. Um, and it, the nice thing is, of course, because this is all managed, we actually have, have an HTTPS environment. But it doesn't exist anymore because we destroyed the instance, so, of course, Chrome is giving an error. So that's good. We removed the, the resources we were using to try this out. So as we merge this to master, what you see is that GitLab immediately reports that it's deployed to staging. So before we looked at staging, it said, hello world. So if we were to visit now at staging and we click on it, we should be able to see, yeah, there we go. Hello cats. So we deployed successfully. So we merged our changes from the branch into master. And those changes as GitLab saw, hey, there's a new commit on master. Let's deploy staging. And GitLab did that all by itself. And it actually says hello cats. Now, this is all very nice, um, but maybe we're not happy yet with these changes before shipping them to production. Um, and I just want to show you one small more thing uh, that I forgot to do. Let's see. Normally I would do this in one step, but I forgot to make a small change. So let's do the same process. I'm going to do it very quick, 
and just want to show you one little thing because not only do you have the so I'm just going to make a change. So I'm going to add one exclamation point here and I'm again and rather than saying let's say more excitement and then what I'm doing is I'm going to say fixes one because we created that initial issue and if I do this what happens is that GitLab sees oh fixes one it will actually close the issue for me because I'm done with it and then we get this really nice uh, reference yeah so let's make the change directly to master go ahead Tamir oh, I thought there were more questions so let's 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 have no. a look Mm -hmm. It says fixes one, and if I click on the issue, we actually now see that I close it by this commit. And if we were going to go to the pipelines, we see that this change, of course, did the same thing, started a new pipeline, which will build and then eventually deploy to staging. Let's have a look again. All right. And if we were like now to go to issues and to boards, we see this is automatically claimed, closed as well. So simply by making a commit and saying that I fixed a particular issue, I, of course, in a merge request, I got the review app, but what I also had is that automatically my issue tracker closed the issue and moved it forward through the stage. All right, so I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, let's have a look at the pipelines. And we see that again, master is deployed to staging, so if I were to go to environments, staging, I can open it. I see, ah, there's my two exclamation points. Hello, kids. Okay, so we deployed to staging. We, what we did is we created the a merge request, we made some changes, we merged them, um, and then GitLab took that, those changes and deployed to staging. But what I didn't show you is something we call production, right? And that's the most important environment that you have. So rather than automatically deploying to production, what we did is we made production a manual step. And that means that in order to actually do deployment to production, we have to manually do something. And we did that on purpose so that if something goes wrong, we have time to first check it out on staging, or we have to time to first manually review it on staging, and then only when we want it, we deploy it to production. So not on a Friday afternoon, actually Tuesday morning is a pretty good time to uh, deploy to production. So let's see what we would do. So I could I could do it right here, or I can click on the pipeline here. And here you see exactly what I mean. So you see the build stage that completed. You see staging, as we know that this is live. Actually, we should go to the latest one. There we go. And now you see here production manual play action. And if I press here, what will exactly happen is that GitLab will now run this step. So I'm pressing play and we are brought to the actual build log for the job. And this is not a reference to my name, just because this is called the job. Um, and what this does is that it takes this build which we created in the first step, and that before we already deployed to production, and of course this is in GitLab's artifact storage, right? Um, and it deploys us to this environment that we define as production. In this case, we use an environment that we just called production, uh, for this specific app, but in normal star circumstances, this would be pointed at your actual production uh, place. And well, it was already done because we had the build already done. GitLab CI is extremely fast, so it only took 18 seconds, as you can see. So that means we should have a new environment right here. There we go. We have here environment production, and we see that there's a, a commit there. So let's have a look. View deployment. Hello, Gets. So you see here, websites, wow. website, the actual website that I did, and that is uh, production. Now, there's two more things I want to show you. The first up, there's a very obvious button here, which is monitoring. And actually, if I click on this button, I should be able to see performance data, but maybe my Prometheus is misbehaving. Let's have a look here. Ah, there we go. Okay, it, it took a while for the data to go in, so I'm looking now at staging. So, because with GitLab, we ship Metamost, as you saw, so you have Jet, but we also ship Prometheus, which is an extremely powerful monitoring solution. We can automatically monitor your apps. And of course, you can manually configure this, so you can monitor any kind of variables that you want. 
But out of the box, if you're using Kubernetes or some other solution, some other container solution, you immediately get these monitoring. So we actually are looking at the data for, in this case, the staging container for CPU usage here, and we see here memory usage. So you see that it's slowly dropping down because it did a deploy a while ago, and now it's just it doesn't use as much memory. It's slowly cleaning up. This is a very powerful very nice. way to quickly get an idea of your instance. And now the coolest about this is, is that if I go to merge request, and let's see, because was, Prometheus was a little bit slow. Yes, it's not loading deployment statistics. So what would happen if, um, I, I'm not sure what is wrong, I'm, maybe I forgot to uh, update my instance. This is this one I have already for a while. But what will happen is that, and in GitLab 93 in particular, what will happen is that he, right here in your merge request, you will see the statistics. So you will see how CPU, how memory has changed when you deploy this, when you merge this code. So it will take a snapshot of what the performance is before, it, and it will take a snapshot of what the performance is after deploying this. It will compare them to and GitLab will actually report to you, oh, this is how your performance changed this particular, um, with this particular merge request. All right, Tamir, are there I, any more questions? Yeah, I see no more questions. And by the way, about the performance issue, no worries about, I mean, if you have a demo that I can share later with all registered users, so, you know, just give yeah, me a course. link and we will share it. Okay, yeah, I, I see a few more questions. Uh, can you see it or do you want me to recite it? Let's, let's see if I can see it myself. Uh... Oh, yeah, okay, I, I see them myself here. Okay, so the first one for now is from uh, Yossi. Uh, do, do you support parallel pipelines? And yes, yes, we do support parallel pipelines. Can, can, you, can, can, you, can, you, you know, can you recite the, the question for all the audience? Yeah, okay, so the question is, do you support parallel pipeline steps, for example, deploy into two different staging environments in parallel? Yes, um, and so I know that they are working right now on GitLab.com, but what I can try to do, and this is the, the, the risk of a live demo, I, I'm here on GitLab.com, <laughs> the public instance, I can try to show you how we do it for GitLab itself. And then you can see just how powerful GitLab CI is. So I'm going to go to GitLab Community Edition, and I know they were working on it, so if it's a little bit slow, forgive me. Let's go to Pipelines, and let's just have a look at a pipeline for master. So let's have a look. There's here commits. Ah, here we find one for master. Now you see already that this looks a bit more complex than the stuff that we've been doing. But let's look at the actual pipeline. All right. So here we go. This is whenever we make a, a, a commit to master of the GitLab project itself. This is what happens. We start by a preparation step. We have a before step, which is a, a, a manual step where we can actually build a package, but we can do it on request, right? So we don't always do it when it is. Then we do two parallel steps. We do a knapsack and, a, and setting up the test environment. And then we have an enormous parallel step called test. And here you can see we do a huge number of parallel things. And actually, you see numbers behind here, because not only do we have parallel steps, but we have the ability to have parallel inside of parallel steps. So if you have a test suite with, for instance, the GitLab test suite, if you were to run it sequentially, it would take many hours, because we have many, many, many thousands of tests. So what we do, rather than doing them sequentially, um, we actually run our tests, individual tests, in parallel. So if I click on here, you see that the, the R spec, which is a testing framework we use for MySQL, is not one, but it's actually 20 parallel tests at the same time. So our entire test suite is parallelized within GitLab CI. And GitLab gives you a nice framework to show it, right? Because in other situations, if you were to do this in Jenkins, you would just see an endless, endless list of uh, parallel steps. And that doesn't work, of course, so we collapse um, things that have the same name but with the number at the end. So That's we run all. Yes, it's, it's extremely powerful. So what happens actually? So this this one is running right here. Set the setup uh, step still. Once we hit the test one, 
not only do we run all of this in parallel, we actually create all the containers to do this in parallel. So at this point, uh, let's see, one, two, three, well, uh, until here there's like 15 different stuff, and then here, 20, 20, 10, 10, see. So what we do at this point in time, we actually create not one runner or a few runners. We actually create, oh, I think about 100 runners. We create them new just for this parallel step. And after the step is done, we put them down again or we reuse them for, for other jobs that demand attention. But we all probably only create them for this step and we quickly spin them up and we pull them down again. So we don't have a huge cost of maintaining you know, 70 different runners for every single commit. No, we just spin them up whenever we need them. And only the seconds that we use um, we pay for that usage. And of course, afterwards, we have the post test, and we actually, another thing that GitLab can do is it can public static pages, right? Maybe you're familiar with GitHub pages, or GitLab can do the same, but it does it much more powerful because it, it is built in CI, so we can just publish any kind of thing. We don't need to have any sort of framework around it. We don't need to use Jekyll. No, we can just publish any kind of HTML page. So what we do is we, after the test, we report coverage, which you can see inside of GitLab, we run a linter, we update Knapsack, and then we publish those results to a page somewhere so we can view the actual statistics of our test. You can view them, of course, in GitLab, but very detailed things specific to frameworks that we wouldn't be able to see in GitLab, we actually deploy to a page, an HTML page, that we can quickly see. And it uses the same technologies we use for the review apps, but now we use it to publish an HTML page to quickly view, uh, view particular information that you might want to see. All right. Nice. That's nice. Very nice. Yeah, I, I just want to to tell everyone that now it's uh, eleven forty-five and we have another thirty minutes, so it's all. <laughs> I'm also informing you. So I, I see here another question, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you know you, you can proceed, and we will take another break uh, at the end. Okay. Yeah. Um. So uh, Elad says, when the pipeline is waiting for the next stage, does it hold processes threads for the pipeline? Does it take resources from the system? So actually what, it, what is happening is that when you're finished with one job, we try to reuse. So GitLab itself manages your runners, right? You, what you can do is you can say, I want to have auto scaling runners. In that case, GitLab will say, well, are there any runners available? And then fix that runner. If you have dedicated machine, but because maybe you don't want an auto scanning thing, then it will just see a look. Well, those dedicated machines are they available? Um, but yeah, let's see. Does it hold process threads for the pipeline? Does it take resources from the system? Um, so yeah, it only takes resources when it needs them, and all and when it's waiting for something. So when it's waiting for resources to be available, it doesn't preserve them. After it's done using them, it frees them immediately. If you want. You always have the option to say, I want dedicated resources for this project. Let's say that you have one project where you have to do testing on iOS or macOS, right? So you need this macOS mm -hmm. machine and you only have one in the office. Yeah. But you can, you can say, I want to have a runner running on this. I am giving a, a tag called uh, macOS, for instance, or uh, iOS. And then only projects with that tag should be able to use this resource. So then, all other projects won't consume that resource because you want it to be always ready for those projects needing this particular thing. In other situations, you can have shared runners, which is what we're using here, which is runners that are available to everyone or subset. You can tag them, you can bind them to a specific project. The possibilities are endless, as you can hear. So uh, feel free to ask more questions and I can go into more detail. Okay. Yeah, yeah I see you another one. Yeah. Uh, from S. What if you realize while running tests that you need to add another one? Can you add it to the queue without stopping the current running test? So this is a really interesting question. So because this is all happening in parallel and it's based on a commit that you made, um, you don't need to think in this way. You don't need to stop it. You don't need to worry about it because you can just either let them finish. You can also stop them, right? I can go in here and I can say, Oh, stop this test. See, there's just a cancel button here. Um, actually, this one is now already done, I think. Oh, it's still running. So I could stop it, but it's not necessary because if you want to add a change to your pipeline, you have to make a commit to your CI. So you always know what the change is and what, and it's always predictable, right? So 
if you have a particular commit and you send it to GitLab CI, right now it will perform the pipeline as you define it. If any point in the future you want to run that specific commit again, you don't need to prepare anything. You don't need to think how it was my setup because your setup is actually in your repository. So if you think, oh, I, I, I should add something else to my test, you just make a new commit and you make the changes to your GitLab CI to add another stage or to add another test or to add something else and GitLab will just spin it up again. And that ensures that your pipelines will always work as they were intended. So they work today and they will work in the future independent of what changes about your project because we execute it for a particular commit and that commit has the uh, uh, CI configured in a certain way. So we are still comfortable running very old versions of GitLab on our CI because the CI definition, the actual definition of how we run tests is in that same commit. So it's relevant to that particular time. I hope that made sense. Yeah, of course. And uh, you know, if you have further questions in future, so you, you, you can ask us and we will see, we will see, uh, we will find the right person to, <laughs> to get back to you with answers. Okay, so do you want to proceed now? And we will take another break of questions in the end. Yeah, I, I showed my main uh, demo to me. I would be happy to, to show any, any, any other thing in particular, but I, I think I showed the main things I wanted to show. And uh, mm -hmm. I, was, okay. I was hoping people would tell me what, uh, what they would be interested in hearing more. Okay, okay. So, I, oh, I, I've just found some questions uh, in, in a private, uh, in, in my private, private channel. So, uh, the first one is about uh, supporting Hebrew. So, <laughs> I, I think I can, an I can answer it by myself. So, the question was uh, if, uh, if, if you can enter, if you can, uh, if you can uh, enter text in Hebrew. So, from my experience, I can say that uh, yes, you, you, can, you, can, uh, you can enter the text in Hebrew and English and it supports BIDI, I mean, BD, BIDI directional, and uh, we, we, we have already tested it and it should work. Um, that's, that's great to hear. I, I have to be honest, I, <laughs> I wasn't sure about it myself. I don't write any Hebrew. So. <laughs> you should start. <laughs> I, sh I should start, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Another question I got in a private in my private channel is, why should we need multiple SNEs? Oh, that's a good question. Actually, for a very long time at GitLab, we said to each other, "Well, we don't need this because we think a single person should be uh, responsible for a single issue." But then our team started to grow, and we realized that sometimes there's more than one owner to a particular thing. Right? Sometimes. You have, for instance, someone working on the front end at the same time as someone working on the back end. And we wanted to have a way to communicate that to say basically, okay, this is the person working on it, but this person is also working on it. So if you have anything, both of these people should be updated. Both of these people should be referred to as being the owner, as being the assigned to a particular issue. And that's why we introduced it. Of course, if you're not interested in it, you should not use it, right? Like in most cases uh, for us as well, we still use only a single assignee, but it's important to have that ability for when the situation arrives. Yeah, okay. I, I see another question that uh, has been asked uh, during the registration. Mm -hmm. um, just a second. How best to do cross-platform repository issue management and 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 the, and another question the diff, on the same uh, on the same one and the differences in the paid version paid versions sure so it's a it's a two prong question so because we want to create a singular experience right you have a single tool where you can do everything you want what you can do within GitLab is you can refer from any project in GitLab to any other project to any other project to any other issue within GitLab. So if I have here a project uh, cat's website and I make an issue here, let's just create an issue here. Um, uh, dogs are not good. And I submit the issue. And then let's say I create another project because we're talking about cross project management. Cat's website and we want to make a forum. I'm not going to put anything in this in this one. 
and I create an issue here uh, about dogs. See also, and what I can do is I can actually refer to that specific issue. So I can say cats website and it was issue number two, I think. And you see that when GitLab transforms, when it takes the markdown, it actually allows you to reference that other issue. So if I submit this issue, you see here that I referenced that and I can click on it and I'm brought there. And you see that GitLab automatically adds a note that this is mentioned in this other project number one. Now, the issue management is a very complex subject and there's a lot to it. And uh, there's a lot you can do in GitLab. For instance, what you can do is you can say, I want to have a milestone across my projects. So what you can do is you can actually create a milestone across projects. So here you can see all the issues belonging to this group. And I can create a milestone here. And then any of the projects underneath that are able to use that. Well, let's say um, version one. I can set a start date and an end date. I can create it. And then what I can do is I can say, well, of the website, I uh, want to make sure to add an issue. You see the burn down chart here, but I don't have any issues yet, so I have to add those. There's many different ways to do this, but GitLab gives you very powerful tools to do this. One thing that we're working on actually right now is the ability to have issue boards on a group level. Right now, you are not able to do that. You have issue boards per project, and you can still relate in there to all the projects, but we don't have them yet on the group level. And in GitLab 9.5, so that is two months and two days away, uh, we'll be releasing that. And then you'll be able to see the board across the project. So there's many different ways of doing it. Now, what are the differences between the paid version and the free version? They're quite extensive. Um, the first one, I think, that is very easy to spot is, of course, the ability to have multiple assignees. You're not able to do that in the free version. You can set issue weights. In, inside of a GitLab Enterprise Edition. So you can say, oh, this is a very complex thing or not very complex thing. And the burndown charts will take, uh, take that into account. The burndown charts themselves are exclusive to Enterprise Edition. And we're working on reporting for time tracking. So you can do basic time tracking right now, but for good time tracking uh, reports, you can only have it in Enterprise Edition. And when we're talking about issue boards, the list is even more extensive. So issue boards in community edition, free edition is, is quite limited. It's good for very small teams, but if you're doing serious development, you want an, a few extra tools. So what you can do in enterprise edition is you can have multiple boards. So you can say, I want to create a board, for instance, for my front end team. And you can say, I want to pin that to a specific milestone. So you really create a workflow tool. So in the community edition, this is more of an organizational tool. You have lists and categories and you can shuffle those around and by pinning it to a milestone what you're saying oh I'm creating a real workflow with a specific time frame and here of course I can add any kind of list so I can say for instance um, backend work to do I'll just say backend work and I could get that one and I want to say front end oh, let's create a new one front end and because this is pinned to a specific milestone, I can now easily have a real workflow where my developers, they create an issue here, do something cool. And that issue is automatically part of that milestone version one. So again, if I go to the cats view here and I go to issues and to the milestone, you see that there's now yeah, one issue belonging to this here. Website has one open issue. This is the one I just added. Do something cool. You saw it right there. So. And you see now my burnout chart looking very depressing, whereas I have zero things completed and one open. All right, I see more questions. Um, yeah. Could you please refer to Maven and see sharp projects built and deploy? How do you maintain build settings and build machines where the compilation is done? So. This is a great question. So in general, building particular programming languages or using particular frameworks um, is no problem because we, uh, GitLab is agnostic of that, right? So you can use anything you want. The thing that I showed you auto-deploy today is very powerful and it actually works with C-sharp projects as well, but it's, 
is not necessary to use. You can also just define your own GitLab CI YAML and run whatever you want. So independent of what kind of thing you use, this will work for your programming language, for your framework. Um, regarding Maven, so in the same vein, you can, from within GitLab CI, in your configuration, refer to Maven and, for instance, decide to interact with that in any, any specific way. We are thinking right now about how to actually integrate directly with Maven, and we're working on that. We don't have a timeline on that yet. That's very, it's still very tricky. And for a large part, what we want to do is we want you to solve that with GitLab. So because GitLab CI has artifacts, you can use that for most of these kind of jobs. Of course, if you're using Maven, we understand, so we're working on some sort of integration, but you should be able to use it by just writing some code yourself in GitLab CI YAML by saying, oh, this is where my Maven is, and this is my build that I want to send there, etc." How do you maintain build settings and build machine where the compilation is done? So this is a great question. This is actually in sort of a way asked earlier before. So your build settings are just whatever you configure in GitLab CI YAML, and that's specific to a particular commit. So you can always rebuild that commit at any moment. You can say, I want to trigger a build for this commit, and it will always produce the exact same output. And if you want to make sure that the build machine, the runners, as you call them, or slaves and Jenkins, are the same, you can tag them. So you can say, I want to have a specific version. Or what I would do, and I think this is the best way to do it, is you just say in your GitLab CI YAML, you say, this is the Docker image that I want to use. So you can build one in GitLab and store it in the registry indefinitely. And you can just say, well, whenever I need, for instance, a particular build machine, spin one up and base it on, on the Docker image. So then you have 100% sure that you have the exact environment, but it's also very fast. And you can spin up multiple, and you have the ability to just drop them down when you don't need them, right? To scale them down. So whenever you need one, you spin it up, you make sure it's the right one. We have many requests, you spin up multiple, and when you don't need them, you put them down again. We support some plugins to integrate with other projects, such as TFS, Sonar Cube, Nexus, Artifactory, and such. No, we don't have to support um, integration inside of CI. What we do is, because you're so free to integrate whatever you want, you can set up all of these things yourself. So um, I know of a, a large banking organization. Uh, they use GitLab uh, together with GitLab CI. They actually use all of these tools. They use Artifactory and Summer Cube. And if you set it up yourself, it will work perfectly. And as I said before, we're looking into actually providing integration with this. But it shouldn't be a problem to set up these integrations yourself or for a large part, just use the artifact storage inside of GitLab itself, which is very easy to use. Basically, if you have kind of a, any kind of artifact coming out of your build process and you want to maintain it for further steps, you just say, I want to maintain artifacts, and GitLab will be able to easily access them and reuse them in any capacity. And otherwise, it'll just remove them based on your needs. All right. Okay, so I, I just want to say to, to our audience now, it's. Uh, 12 p.m. and I know that some some people are starting to move so I just want to say that uh, if you have any further questions I'm now sharing our email you can ask any questions about GitLab you know it could be technical or if you have questions about pricing licensing and so forth uh, I just want to say you know just referring to the last question about integration that we we can also provide uh, some kind of integration and development to integrate GitLab with some other tools that's what we sometimes uh, provide for our customers and I, I see here two more questions so you know if you have to leave just leave and uh, uh, if you want to stay and you find it interesting so let's let's uh, move forward okay so I, I see here two more questions on my private channel um, the first one is about the GitLab service desk okay mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, the, the question is about uh, what's the difference of uh, GitLab Service Desk uh, versus uh, Jira uh, Service Desk? The basic idea behind it is the same. So, of course, GitLab Service Desk works within GitLab and Jira Service Desk works within Jira. The fundamental idea is that you email to the issue tracker, and in GitLab you can do that to any project. 
So there's no setup necessary. You don't have to create a specific surface search project. All you have to do is you just have to go in your instance and say, enable service desk for this project. You get a URL, and maybe you create some sort of um, uh, uh, email address specifically for this, but you can use the one that's provided. And then anyone can just email directly to there and you'll be able to interact directly with whomever emailed you inside of GitLab issues. So the beauty of this is, is that you can use this for any project. So let's say that um, at GitLab, uh, we're using this. So if a customer emails to our issue tracker, we will then use that issue to also link to any relevant uh, resources. And because within GitLab, everything is linked up, we can actually, for instance, say, if a customer says, well, uh, I'm using this version and this is what broke, we can actually look up the exact commit, link it directly there, and we have a single source of truth for all the information related to the problem the customer might be having or the request the customer might be having. So fundamentally, the idea is the same, right? Jira Service Desk and GitLab Service Desk, but it's the extra value that we provide by creating that singular tool so you can quickly iterate or take that ideas, take those requests or those complaints or bugs or whatever for your customer has and work with them and refer to them throughout the organization. For instance, if we get an issue somewhere from a customer saying this is broken, the dependency that might be involved in this can link directly to that and can or vice versa, of course. They'll be up to date with that. Okay. Okay. And and I see here uh, another question. Uh, another one another one question. Um, it's about the elastic search that you mentioned earlier. So uh, the question is, why, why, why do we need the elastic search if it's always necessary? And uh, what, what, what extra features it provides? That's a great question. So elastic search uh, is an addition to GitLab. It's only available in enterprise edition. And it's very simply, it makes search much faster. So you can search rather than searching just code within a particular repository, you can now search code throughout the whole instance. So over all projects, you can search through all code, all issues, all, basically anything. And it gives you the extra option to do advanced search keywords, such as um, search either for this or that, or search for this exact key phrase. And we're using the built-in search of GitLab. It, it just uses plain search. So it will search, it will match with any of your keywords and you cannot do things like end or or, or explicit um, combinations of words. I would say the most important part is that you can now search through all the code on your server. And that's, that's very useful because if you have a particular thing, you, you're like, oh, I, I, I remember seeing this code, something similar before, but I don't know, you just type for instance as a part of the function that you might remember, it will search through all projects and give you any of the matches. Okay. Great, and uh, I, I see here another question in my private uh, channel. Uh, you mentioned before the review apps, okay? Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, what it actually provides for non-technical users? Uh, well, that's a really good question, and I'll tell you exactly what. If you are a non-technical user, and someone makes a change, right? Someone makes a merge request. Mm -hmm. Anyone, technical or non-technical, can see the actual changes. So that means you can get a preview of exactly what is being changed. It doesn't matter, you don't have to have anything for it. You can see the changes. And I'm actually gonna show you a preview, uh, a, a real life example. Okay. Uh, so, when, when do you, ju just one question for me. Sure. When, you, when you say a non-technical user, do you actually mean, a, let's say a sales guy or Something like that? Right, uh, that's exactly what I mean. So at GitLab, we have a lot of engineers, but we have a lot of non-technical people as well. And uh, we have a lot of salespeople and marketing people. Okay. And those people should be able to try out changes and they should be able to make changes to the website and preview them without having to understand the code and how that will affect. So any change that we make, we create a review app and anyone can just click on that review app and see the changes. So if you were to go to our website right now, let's go to our website, GitLab blog, for instance, and you see that 
the release post for 903 it's not live yet right because yeah. we're only releasing that on on thursday mm -hmm. but we want to be able to preview that we want anyone in the company to be able to help write the release post and preview it so we actually have a review app live with the release post so if i go to here you see Good. release 93 <laughs> you see our website you see that here oh, yeah. we have the blog post which is only live on june 22nd you can click on it and i'm sorry for spoiling you all but this is what it's going to look like okay uh, very interesting changes and you can see that we're releasing code quality multi-project pipeline graphs and much more cool things and that is the the power of review apps to me mm -hmm. review apps is what the future of code review of change review is because you can don't just have to look at the code and imagine what will happen and then hope that mm -hmm. by the time it's live it all works and, and acts like you expect it to you can actually see the changes. You don't have to think anymore about, you know, oh, we should deploy this to staging. Oh, but someone else is deploying some new staging. No, you don't have to fight about it. And you just see the actual changes in the review. Line. Very powerful idea, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I can understand the benefits, of course. Okay, I, I see no more, no more questions, but uh, maybe we have uh, time for another one. If, 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 if you want to ask the last question, feel free to text it right now. <laughs> Okay, let's wait a few more seconds. No, probably not, so. <laughs> okay, so just as I said again, if you have any further questions in future about GitLab, so feel free to contact us at GitLab, Git, GitLab at almtoolbox.com. Uh, thank you very much, Job, and I really appreciate your time and, and the, the opportunity you, you joined us. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. And um, thank you very much, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.